August 1940. World War II rages on across the globe. In Los Angeles, Hedy Lamarr, an international superstar who was considered to be the most beautiful woman in the world, was sitting at a piano next to Hollywood composer George Antile. But they weren't creating a score for a new film. They were creating something with the potential to change the course of the war and the future of the planet. The two of them were playing side by side on the piano, one kind of starting a musical score and the other kind of following, almost in an echoing pattern. This echoing pattern would ultimately inspire a technology that could protect allied communications from access interception, having the potential to change the trajectory of the war. This is The Lightbulb Moment, a Cheddar and Curiosity Stream original series. Hedy Lamarr was born in Vienna, Austria in 1914 into a Jewish family. Stories from her childhood suggest she had a knack for inventing from the start. At five years old, she took apart a music box that her father gave her and put it back together. As she got older, however, opportunities for her artistic skill set presented themselves more prominently. At 16, she was hired as a script girl for the production company Sasha Film. But it was hard to overlook Lamar. Soon after being hired, she got a few small speaking parts in movies, which soon led to her first leading role in the 1932 German comedy film No Money Needed. But the film that brought her the most fame, changing the course of her life forever, was Ecstasy. It was sort of billed as an art film, but in fact, it was the very first non-pornographic all nude film in Europe at that time. And it, it truly was not a pornographic movie, it was an art film, but at the same time, there had never been a fully uh, unclothed actress appearing on screen. The world now had its eye on Hetty, and she knew she had to choose her next role wisely, as it was her only path to defining and refining her image to the world. With that, she decided that her next role would be in the stage play Sissy, which was going to run on the German equivalent of Broadway. She would portray Empress Elizabeth of Austria. And it's there on the stage that she really encountered the first primary force in her life, and that was Fritz Mandel. Mandel was 13 years older than Lamar at 33 and had already been married and divorced once. He also happened to be the third richest man in Austria at the time. He was the owner of this vast munitions manufacturing empire. To get an idea for just how powerful Mandel was, one journalist claimed it was said of him that he could break a prime minister faster than he could snap a toothpick in half. But to Hetty, Mandel was charming, at least at the start. Eight weeks after they met, the two were married. And at some point thereafter, he learned about ecstasy. He was not only scandalized, but he absolutely did not want anyone else laying eyes on his now wife naked. According to TCM, Mandel spent $280,000, or if you account for inflation, five and a half million dollars on suppressing the release of ecstasy, trying to buy every single copy in existence. He wanted to control her kind of as a way of controlling his own world. Lamar was forced into the role of a traditional housewife. That meant being the pleasant host to all of Mandel's friends and business partners who came to their house to talk shop. He did most of his business work really by entertaining people. He wasn't holding meetings with Mussolini's right-hand man at in an office. He was having him come to their home and they were hosting a ball for him. So I think that sort of aspect was really intoxicating to Hetty. She gained intel on the types of weapons that the Nazis had access to, like the radio-controlled glide bombs that became the predecessors to the smart bombs in use today. She also learned a great deal about the torpedoes the Nazis would one day use to sink ships traveling from Germany to the United States, including ships that carried Jewish refugees. Lamar became increasingly frightened of the role her husband was playing in the war to come. After a few years of an increasingly toxic marriage, she began planning an escape from the hostile pre-war environment in Austria. 
she decided to play the long game. Don't forget, she's an actress, so she sort of plays the role of the docile wife for a stretch, and she very slowly kind of lays the seeds for hiring a, a, her own personal maid, something she hadn't had before. She painstakingly finds a maid that actually bears a striking resemblance to her. And then after a, a period of months, she's at a dinner party with Fritz and, and a bunch of other people. She feigns illness. The personal maid, of course, comes back to her chambers to help get her ready for bed. She slips sleeping tablets into the maid's drink. So the maid falls asleep. She takes her uniform and a small bag that she had packed. Because of course she couldn't like exactly leave with a suitcase, but she had a bunch of jewels and some money, a small amount of clothes. And she escapes uh, through the back of the house as if she were the maid leaving for the day. She took the maid's car made her way to the train station, and from the train station, made her way to Paris, and from there to London. And once she was in London, she was really outside Fritz's reach at that point. You know, his power really didn't stretch that far, and she was able to escape from him. Hedy Lamarr landed in Hollywood in October of 1937, and immediately got to work on her first American film, Algiers. The 1938 movie was a smash hit. Once she came to this country and all those things um, that she was concerned were going to happen started to come to pass, it started to really fuel in her this desire to do whatever she could to really strike out against the Nazis. One night at a Hollywood dinner party, Lamar met someone who could help. George Antile, known as the bad boy of music, was an avant-garde composer, most known for his passion project, The Ballet Mechanique, a composition in which he synchronized 12 player pianos to autonomously play a pre-planned symphony. But he was also, at one point, a U.S. munitions inspector as well as an author. Hetty invited him over for dinner. And I'm sure he was curious as to what it was about. And in many ways, he was a strange person to seek out for this. But during that dinner, she told him um, about this incredible access that she'd had to all this really inside information about the war. One consistent message was the power of radio and the role it would play in World War II weaponry and communications. Intercepted or jammed radio frequencies could wreak havoc on military maneuvers. The two aimed to find a solution to this weakness by creating an impenetrable frequency to be used in torpedoes. But taking that idea from paper to prototype was the real challenge. One stepping stone to getting there was looking back at Antile's ballet mechanique and the way in which he had synchronized multiple player pianos autonomously key part of the symphony were these 16 player pianos which had to communicate with one another and play synchronously. The patent for frequency hopping was finally approved in 1942, just eight months after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. It couldn't have come at a better time for the Allied forces. But the Navy caught wind of Lamar's invention before the patent was issued, and they decided not to use it. It may just have been too expensive, too theoretical, too risky. But I have to say, I can't, there will always be a part of me that will wonder whether the fact that Hetty was a woman and a famous, beautiful woman might have affected the decision making. World War II ended three years later on September 2nd, 1945. Lamar and Antile's patent expired 16 years later in 1959. The technology they pioneered didn't fully get a chance to shine until the introduction of simple computing technology. Using a computer, you could generate a pseudo-random number for jumping between frequencies, creating truly secret communications. Computers also increased the number of frequencies that information could be spread across. The technology is now referred to as Frequency Hopping Spread Spectrum, or FHSS. It was deemed so necessary to future warfare that it was used in every ship involved in the Cuban Missile Crisis. FHSS continued to be adapted and used by the military in secret for the next 20 years, until it was declassified thanks to the FCC in 1985. From there, the technology developed by Ms. Lamar would be spun out into devices across industries. 
one of the most useful elements of the technology Lamar pioneered was that it allowed multiple devices to be wirelessly tethered to one system without interfering with each other. Qualcomm used this advantage to adapt FHSS technology to create a cost-effective wireless communication network, or to put it more simply, the modern-day cell phone. FHSS is also used in every Bluetooth device. Spread spectrum frequency hopping is how your headphones can connect to just your device and stay connected without any interference from other Bluetooth devices around you. Even GPS has its roots in Lamar's design. But of all these technologies, the one that's most attributed to Hedy Lamar is wireless internet. In recent years, she has been dubbed the mother of Wi-Fi. Essentially, every piece of wireless technology in use today was made possible due to the breakthrough invention of frequency hopping by Hedy Lamar and George Antile. And yet, for decades, their names were absent from the records. But in 1997, 50 years after her invention, she and George Antile posthumously received the Pioneer Award from the Electronic Frontier Foundation for her contributions in the field of spread spectrum technology. When we look back, you know, at Hetty's life and her invention, I, you know, I often like to invite people to wonder what if, like what if it had been possible for the Navy to try out that invention, making the Allies so much more successful at sea. When you really think about it in terms of number of lives saved, both on the battlefield and in the concentration camps, it's, it's a real loss. Like, I mean, there's, it's a very tangible impact on our world. Hetty's story, yes, on one hand is the story of, a, of an incredible woman and this long legacy, but it's also a cautionary tale about the dangers in underestimating women. Hetty may only now be recognized for her work because of her prior fame and unparalleled beauty. While female inventors without this spotlight still have not gained the recognition they deserve. While so many women are responsible for changing the course of history, too often, these women are underestimated, undercompensated, and underrecognized. As we look back on Lamar's impact on the world, it's important to also look forward at how the world will continue to change. Raising the question, what groundbreaking invention could arise if we stop overlooking the women who could revolutionize our world? Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please like, subscribe, and don't forget to hit the bell for notifications. You can watch full 22-minute episodes every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern on Cheddar's live network or anytime on CuriosityStream.